Welcome to Insight. Today we're chatting with Jeremy Matson, Executive Director of the Greenbelt Alliance. Jeremy joined the Greenbelt Alliance from the San Francisco Foundation where he helped to launch the Great Communities Collaborative and supported social equity, affordable housing, and smart growth efforts around the Bay Area. He previously held positions as a community organizer and lobbyist on fair trade issues and urban quality of life issues, serving as field director for Washington State's Transportation Choices Coalition and the Washington, D.C.-based Citizens Trade Campaign. As executive director of the Greenbelt Alliance, Jeremy Matson focuses on improved support for the San Francisco Bay Area's open spaces. Over the last 50 years, the Greenbelt Alliance has worked in partnership with local municipalities and community and business leaders to secure protection of more than 1.1 million acres of open space and has established urban growth boundaries around 26 cities and five counties. Greenbelt Alliance has also endorsed the creation of 60,000 homes within existing urban areas. Jeremy has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us and I'd like to thank you again, Jeremy, for joining us today. Thank you. So today there are incredible pressures on development, even in a downturn, even with the vagaries of, of our economic situation. The population is not decreasing, diminishing. There is a drive to reduce the consumption of fossil fuels, which tends to focus more on urban areas. And how does the Greenbelt Alliance take all this information, all these pressures, all these desires from various communities and forge a, an approach that also preserves open space mm -hmm. and, and green space? Well, I, th I think for, for us, first of all, I think in your introduction, you really hit on what we do. We focus not just on open space conservation and not just on community development, but really holistically on land use in the San Francisco Bay Area, what it really takes to make this metropolis uh, a really mo a model place for the state, the country, and the world. And so uh, we look at it from the perspective of we want to definitely protect the landscape that is so important, not just from a, a recreation and an aesthetic per, uh, perspective, but also from the perspective of our economy. It's a, uh, our open spaces are what bring people here to go to conventions and then say head up to the wine country. Um, it's also very critical for in, this, uh, in the sense of uh, fresh food and clean water, the very things that sustain us on a day-to-day -day basis. And then we are a growing region. We're going from 7 million to 9 million people over the next 30 years. Uh, and, you know, and that's a good thing. Um, that is uh, what's really fueling this economy that uh, uh, can keep us can keep us sustained as, as a region. And, uh, but we have to put those people someplace. And our thesis is basically those people should go within our existing urban areas. Um, we should use development uh, as a tool. Don't just see it as a, uh, as, a, as a threat or something that we have to manage, but it can be a tool to make the neighborhoods of our region better places. And uh, in the process of providing people with places to live and places to work, we can create um, great neighborhoods where they can, where people can walk to the grocery store or take their kid to the ice cream store. Uh, we can use development as a catalyst for great parks uh, and making a transit system that really is, and a transportation system that really is climate friendly in the end. So we're really looking at this as, you know, not necessarily that we're trying to optimize for a variety of different competing uh, factors, but really what we're trying to do is optimize for sustainability and quality of life. And uh, when we look at it through that lens, it's, it's pretty exciting work. So often um, one hears uh, the, the counter argument to what is called sustainable development, um, and that being a cost argument, right. that sometimes it's less expensive to uh, build a new than to uh, fix a, a, a mm -hmm. site or, or redevelop a site right. that's already been developed. Um, and to, to spread rather than, uh, than build up or right. build deeper. Um, how do you respond to that cost argument? I think there's a few ways of looking at it. Um, if you're looking at it from a very narrow perspective, if you're looking at it from the perspective of uh, is it uh, you know, cheaper in the short term for a developer to go out and buy, say, a piece of farmland and develop that versus redeveloping a site in a downtown, um, yes, that is cheaper for the developer. Now, for society, 
uh, it's more expensive in the long run. Uh, even if the developer pays for the initial roads and sewers, for example, it ends up being the city that uh, pays for the long-term maintenance of that. And there's study after study after study that shows that in more sprawling areas, that long-term cost of maintenance is uh, higher than in more compact places. Um, you can also look at it uh, through the terms of the household. Uh, now for a household, and this has been fueling our growth for uh, years now, it uh, costs more often to buy a home, especially the type of home that people want in a, uh, you know, closer into say downtown San Francisco than out on the urban edge in Brentwood or even over into the Central Valley. Um, the actual cost of the home is, is certainly less. Now if you add up the uh, cost of the home, your, your essentially your home cost, your mortgage, and uh, transportation, um, suddenly you start to see those cancel out and the further you get out, it's actually more expensive uh, to live out on the edge than to live in an urban area. If you look at, uh, I live in the city of Alameda, so you know, pretty close to San Francisco, I can take transit every day. We spend about 9% of our household income on transportation. Uh, somebody who lives out in Brentwood or out in the valley spends a quarter to a third of their income on transportation. Um, so looking at it from that perspective, uh, again, it ends up being uh, less expensive uh, for the household here in uh, closer in areas. Now all that being said, you know, something I think we really need to focus on is making sure we're changing the incentives of how development happens uh, in uh, not just the San Francisco Bay Area but all over the country. We have to make it, um, uh, uh, we have to be providing the money to the cities, for example, to be doing uh, infrastructure development in the places where we want development to happen versus out on the edge. We have to be uh, making it easier for developers to uh, uh, move through a streamlined process to get permits, for example, so that they can do development in the right place versus out on the urban edge. All those, all those changes need to happen. There are definitely Sometimes barriers. easier to actually develop on the urban edge than it is to develop yeah, in, in, certainly, in a certainly. In a city. And that's not a law of nature. That's an artifact of various different policies, various different uh, funding mechanisms, lending uh, policies from, uh, you know, from banks and financial institutions. Those are all things we can change. And so that's part of our job is to change this. So is, is part of your, um, your uh, brief is to, is to switch the incentives embedded in the system? Yeah, yeah I think that's right. Do the biggest part of what social change organizations do is we change the rules that govern society. Um, again, you know, a lot of these rules have been in place for an, a, a really long time, and uh, and it's become kind of second nature to us. Um, but they are again something that we've created, and we can create uh, what comes next. And you know, entering into this era that we're in right now, we're in this this incredible time of change and of concern about where the world is going, you know, whether that be from um, you know, kind of an economic standpoint or an environmental standpoint. And uh, now is the time to change those rules because if we don't change the rules now, uh, you know, the future that we're going to have is something that I think most of us are not looking, would not look forward to. So talk a little bit about your field of play. The Greenbelt Alliance is focused on the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, tell us a little bit about the background of the organization and the the type of contributions that you've made over the last several years? Yeah, we are, um, well, we're 50 years old, um, 51 years old now, which makes us in the nonprofit realm, um, you know, we're not young. Um, and uh, we have always had, we started off actually, uh, our name has changed several times over the years. Um, started off as an organization called People for uh, Parks and Regional Recreation, I believe the name was. And, uh, you know, very much focused on uh, protecting the open spaces of our region uh, for the purposes of getting people out there um, and having people who live in the city have some place go to uh, basically have solace. Um, but really from the start there was always this sense of what we want to have is we want to have great great cities and towns and we want to have this op these open spaces of the region to make the Bay Area the special thing that it is. How big is an open space in order for it to be on your radar? Uh, that's a good question. Um, it's, uh, uh, we historically have focused on, you know, kind of large tracts of land on, you know, the urban edge. So, uh, you know, we generally would talk in terms of thousands of acres. I think, you know, nowadays, uh, 
uh, we're definitely continuing to talk about uh, that scale. For example, this past year, we played a, an integral role in passing two ballot measures, one in Napa County, one in Solano County, that protected close to uh, a million acres um, through policy. Uh, but we also need to think a lot about um, very small pieces of open space, uh, essentially urban parks in our cities. Uh, uh, because as we talk about, again, uh, accommodating this growing population we have, we can't just put people um, in, uh, uh, you know, in, in apartment buildings and, and you know, essentially call, will, will essentially be warehouses for, for people and not create the types of neighborhoods that they want to live in. Um, uh, that is, uh, uh, you know, that's not our vision. And so having the park spaces, the shorelines, uh, you know, the, the, the places to get out and play that are right next door to you, you know, that's very key to us as well. And in terms of, of how you uh, approach your work, are you, do you see yourself primarily working with uh, landowners? Do you see yourself primarily working as, as a lobbyist advocacy organization? What is your role? I, I'd principally call us an advocacy organization. You know, our job is to uh, build the public support for the things we believe in and then influence the people who make the public policy decisions uh, that are going to, as I said, change the rules uh, that govern how growth and development happens in the San Francisco Bay Area. That said, all those other constituencies, uh, you know, landowners, business leaders, the environmental community, the social equity community, public health advocates, those are all the, the groups of people that we need to mobilize around this idea of more livable, sustainable places. And so we work very closely building, you know, a diverse set of coalitions across constituencies that um, you know, oftentimes don't talk to each other, and which again is you know, part of the exciting thing about our work. How do you bring people to the table? I, you know, I, I, as you read in my bio, I started off as a political organizer. And you know, the first thing you learn in political organizing um, is you start where people are at. Um, and so for you know, the example of the social equity community, um, they want better neighborhoods. And they want better neighborhoods not just for the next generation of people who are coming here, but for themselves and for their families. Um, and so when we're talking about in a place like, you know, Oakland or uh, neighborhoods in San, some neighborhoods in San Jose, uh, you know, the idea is uh, let's uh, talk about what you need in this place to uh, make it the type of neighborhood you want to live in. And then let's talk about what do we do, how do we shape development to make that happen? And then what do we do uh, to make sure that, uh, uh, that, that you have the capacity to live here as um, uh, you know, people of more uh, you know, kind of middle class backgrounds maybe are coming in. So you, know, you start with them with that conversation. Uh, with the business community, uh, there's a very strong alliance here from two perspectives. For developers, we want developers to build stuff. We just want them to build it in the right places. Um, and then in terms of some of the big employers in the Bay Area, uh, the, the, the greatest asset we have in this region is uh, kind of our, our, our knowledge-based and innovation-based economy. That means we need to be attracting um, you know, the smartest, most capable people across the country and across the world to come here. They need to have great places to live uh, because they can go anywhere in the world. And so, you know, so the business community is a natural ally for us. Uh, because we're essentially making the places that the people they want are going to want to live. The um, demographics of the Bay Area are shifting dramatically. Um, there is a huge increase in uh, the Asian populations. There is an increase in the, um, in the Hispanic populations. Um, there are uh, shifts um, uh, regionally in terms of, of how the economy functions. Um, how does that impact your constituents? Are your, are your constituents changing? Do you have to bring in new constituents? I think, yes, a couple different ways I can answer that. I think first and foremost, um, we strive to represent the entire population of the Bay Area. And that is, as you just said, um, that's majority minority right now. Um, those are people who don't necessarily consider themselves environmentalists um, and uh, and so I think the other thing to say is we can't just say that in uh, 
you know, kind of as a throwaway line. Um, we have to really walk the walk and talk the talk there. And so again, when you know, we get involved in a community, um, whether it's for an urban development project or for an open space uh, conservation project, we have to, first of all, I think very much listen and uh, understand what people want for uh, the place they live. And then we have to um, uh, make sure that we are authentically, and I want to emphasize that word, authentically um, bringing the ideas and the policies that we have in our tool chest to bear for the benefit of the public. Um, you know, open space conservation in a city like um, uh, you know, Fairfield or Vacaville or up in Sonoma County isn't just for um, pretty places for people from San Francisco to come and visit. Um, it is to make sure that the quality of life of folks in those places is, is, is high, that they have access to some of those open spaces through regional parks, for example, that um, you know, Sonoma County is a great example. Their, uh, their water comes from local watersheds, that those watersheds are protected so they can have uh, clean drinking water. Um, and you know, I think that's the, that is our challenge, is to make sure that we are, um, you know, like I said, truly serving the needs of, uh, of the population of this region. And in terms of, of the economic um, challenges that we're facing, has that, has that hit you uh, at all in terms of, of uh, either positive or negative ways? Right. Um, it's certainly hit us. I think every uh, there are very few nonprofits around, uh, you know, the, the, the region and the state and the country who haven't um, seen some challenges from this, just like there's very few businesses. Um, I think we're fortunate in that we haven't seen a major dip in our, uh, in our, in our fundraising um, or in the interest that people have in our issues. And I think that's because from really the day the economic crisis really became apparent, um, we have remained aggressive and we've said, um, you know, this is an indication that the world that we've been living in doesn't work. Guess what? For 50 years we've been saying the world that we've been living in doesn't work. But we've also seen um, some opinion polls recently come out where uh, issues like global warming um, is really beginning to take a back seat to economic concerns. Issues like the environment or environmental conservation mm -hmm. Um, are being seen as secondary, even tertiary concerns. Yeah, but I would say p issues of um, uh, you know how do we live uh, a high quality of life uh, certainly are not taking a backseat. In fact, people are talking about you know well in this in this adjusting world, how do we continue to to live well? Um, what we are about in the Bay Area, I'd say, is you know we're about land conservation. We're about a climate friendly uh, a climate friendly Bay Area, but we're about a better Bay Area. We're about higher quality of life. We're about and a higher quality of life on, um, you know, maybe a tighter budget. Um, so you know, uh, we're lucky. For example, here is that you can go, you can do the staycation in the Bay Area, um, and you know, we want to make that uh, a really enjoyable experience. And so, like I, as I was saying, I think we have been extremely aggressive about saying that we are part of the vision for uh, uh, you know, a, more, a more sustainable, and that's not just environmentally sustainable, but more economically sustainable, more personally sustainable uh, uh, way of life. And, uh, and we've been aggressively pursuing you know, our donors and our constituents to, uh, uh, to stay with us in that process. And by being aggressive, I think we've done, uh, you know, knock on wood, uh, we've done well so far. Have you, uh, ha have you seen the, the composition of your donation shift? Uh, and Talk a little bit about about um, how, what your what your funding sources are. Is it is it very broad? Is it a lot of little uh, donations? Is it do you rely more on foundations or on uh, government on, yeah. on major gifts? So first of all, I think we're lucky in that we are pretty broad. Um, we historically have been uh, you know, pretty much uh, the two biggest sources have been foundations and major donors, folks who give over a thousand dollars. And then membership events, uh, a few other small streams, are uh, end up being about 20% total. Um, we've seen a little bit of a shift over the last year uh, from uh, major donors and foundations being essentially equal to foundations being a little bit higher. I think right now we're about 50% foundations, 30% major donors. 
Um, that's not necessarily because we've seen a huge drop in, uh, in major donors, but I think our foundation numbers have actually gone up a little bit. Again, one of the, I think when foundations are looking for how do we make systemic change and build a more sustainable, uh, you know, more sustainable place, they look to organizations like us. So, um, so we, we have that, uh, that breadth of uh, fundraising um, uh, sources. Uh, I, we've seen, you know, a few of our major donors have stepped back, not surprisingly. Um, a few more have stepped up. Um, uh, we've been very heartened to see that our, our membership base, which are, you know, the folks who give out of their income, um, has we expected that to go down significantly. They pretty much stayed with us. We've seen a 5% drop or something, but nothing, nothing too profound. So again, knock on wood, but you know, for the time being, I think we're, uh, we're doing pretty well. Um, and I think we just have to you know, continue doing a good job and continue doing a good job of getting our message out there um, to maintain that. And where do you see Greenbelt Alliance heading in the next several years? Are you going to expand your reach? Are you going to focus more on certain issues? I think, um, well, we recently put out uh, a new vision for the region, and it was in, uh, encompassed in two documents, one called Grow Smart Bay Area, which is basically uh, talks about the uh, research that we just finished up that uh, documents that we can achieve our next generation of growth within our existing urban footprint. And the other one called Golden Lands, Golden Opportunity, that is about uh, the uh, uh, values, the open spaces of the Bay Area have to our population, even if, again, if you're not somebody who's into outdoor recreation, but the clean water, the fresh food, et cetera. So um, those two documents, like I said, are, are both underlined, uh, have under, underneath them uh, some very rigorous research which really points us to, you know, what are the places that we need to focus on around the region to uh, make the, in most cases, municipal level policy changes to make the Bay Area the type of place we want it to be. So our focus for the next several years is really going to be to, you know, let's go into those uh, target places. Um, let's build up the, 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 the coalitions and the broad-based citizen constituency for change. Um, some of which is going to be very hard to do. People, you know, we generally have not had a, a strong history in this region of building up uh, uh, a, a, a broad base for good growth. We are good at stopping bad growth, but we need to also build up that broad base for good growth. So as part of what you're trying to do is to shift this from being uh, an issue where camps are fighting against each other and instead talk about solutions and draw from each camp. That, that, I think that's a good way of, of summarizing it. I think we're, um, we definitely want to move past the idea that um, development, some think development is good and others think development is bad. Um, I think that's uh, uh, part of the rationale that has gotten this region into uh, some of the challenges that we have. Um, and we definitely, certainly there are bad places to develop. Um, you know, we're in the midst of a, uh, of, a, of a campaign right now to try to stop a uh, development on a piece of farmland in the middle of the delta that's you know, several feet below sea level um, uh, behind you know, levees that were engineered 100 years ago. It's uh, you know, New Orleans waiting to happen here in the Bay Area, um, plus it's incredibly uh, uh, unfriendly toward the climate. So we want to see that kind of thing not happen. But we want to build uh, uh, people who believe they're environmentalists, people who believe that they are for sustainability, um, need to be supporters of good infill development that meets community needs. And again, you know, historically we've not, as, a re as an organization or as a region, uh, done a good job of building that constituency. And that's, our, you know, that's a big part of our challenge over the next uh, several years. And you get involved in housing, you get involved in place, uh, placing businesses, you get involved in infrastructure, transportation infrastructure mm -hmm. included, right. uh, basically anything that has to do with this, this idea that somehow sprawl is better than, um, than focus. Right. Basically anything that has to do with how we use the land base of the San Francisco Bay Area is within our purview. Um, so it's, as you said, it's where we put the homes, where we put the jobs, what type of homes, uh, you know, what uh, kind of uh, business development happens there, uh, what, are the, what is the infrastructure that is necessary to serve that, that's all within, within our purview. 
And I have one final question, and, and it really revolves around what you started with. You started off talking about how while development in the short term might be less expensive for an individual mm -hmm. um, in, in one location, the society pays for it over the long term right. in terms of maintaining it. It seems to me that, that what's also happening is that there's a bit of a cost shifting that's going on where an individual who is developing um, is going to take advantage of the fact that the, the total cost of ownership, if you, wanna, if you wanna call it that, or the total cost of existence of that development is actually shifted onto society, onto others downstream. And the short-term costs and benefits um, are what is included under the commercial right. aspect. It seems to me that in order to, to rebalance, there is going to have to, have to be some rebalancing mm -hmm. so that some of those costs are brought forward in terms of benefits mm -hmm. for people who would like to establish businesses, who would right. like to build jobs, who would like to build developments. Mm -hmm. How does that work? Well, I think, again, I, I would say that that is uh, part of the big public policy challenge that we, we have. Um, you know, what you just described is kind of that classic thing you learn in freshman economics about externalities. Um, so, you know, we have to internalize those costs where they exist. Um, a lot of those costs, you know, do not exist uh, for if you're doing, you know, for example, uh, development in uh, a, a downtown where people drive or will drive uh, a, a quarter of the amount that they would um, on some place on the urban edge. Um, you save on highways, you save on public transportation, you save on yeah, water infrastructure, exactly, you save exactly, on electrical infrastructure. Exactly. And so, and so figuring out, for example, you know, the impact fees, uh, having impact fees for places on the urban edge that really uh, demonstrate that uh, the cost of that place uh, is important and making sure that the fees you're paying to do development in a downtown area um, are you know not as substantial and that um, uh, and and that we're using uh, you know for example some of the uh, dollars that are in the coffers of Sacramento to uh, pay for the upfront cost of infrastructure and whatnot versus relying on development fees to to pay for that so there's you know any myriad of different ways of figuring out the the policy pieces fortunately I'm not the one that's looked to to come up with all of those answers we have lots of very smart people our job is once we uh, you know kind of identify what those are uh, you know within our organization and within the alliances that we have um, that we go out and again build that uh, political base of support to uh, to make it happen and politically with the um, with California being in mm -hmm. such a dire right. financial situation it's it's probably very difficult to get people to a, to attend to these issues well I think again um, there's a few different things going on. I think uh, it is, uh, I think, challenging to, you know, uh, maybe I'll put it this way. There's a lot of different uh, issues that are vying for people's attention. Yes. Um, uh, we are lucky in the sense that what we're basically talking about is not, you know, we're not talking about the war in Afghanistan. We're not talking about health care. Um, we're not talking about things that on one level or another are somewhat abstract to folks. We're talking about um, what's the quality of life going to be in your community, um, uh, you know, a year from now and ten years from now. Um, are your kids going to be able to uh, afford to buy a home, um, you know, near where you live, so you can see your grandkids? Those are the issues that we work on, and um, I think, uh, you know, despite all the other things that are vying for people's attention. When you talk to people about, well, what's going to go on in your neighborhood or what's going to go on in your town, you know, they're receptive. There's, a, there's, a, there's an audience there that wants to talk about that. And, uh, and so we're, we're lucky in the sense that that's the scale that we work at. Well, thank you so much for sharing your, your insights with us today. I think that, um, that the, the quality of life issue is something that we'll live with every day. Mm -hmm. And organizations like yours takes this dialogue and just drives it home and, and uh, creates the kind of, of uh, environment that allows us to have a, a good quality of life in this, uh, in this area. Well, that's what we're aiming for. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you, Mark. You, sir.